patient with stage four breast cancer. So these are the purposes of my case study, more or less just to kind of gauge in some discussion regarding some alternative uh, treatment methods, as well as recognize the importance for screening red flags, as well as uh, the importance of psychosocial factors. Okay, so chart review. So this is the information that is given to me prior to even speaking with my patient. So 65 year old female who's coming in for low back pain, which she is associating with a herniated disc. She uh, is coming, or she actually had the initial onset of pain on January the 16th, 2017. I'm currently seeing her like three to four weeks afterwards. So like the first or second week of February, she is coming in direct access. And then some important outcome measures to note, her initial photo score was 50. And I'll kind of talk about that later. And then her FabQ physical activity was an eight, which is categorized as low. So also with the, uh, the chart that's given to me prior to speaking with her, there's an overview of past medical history and goals. So like the title suggests, stage four breast cancer, uh, osteopenia, anxiety, osteonecrosis, and lymphedema. And then she did mention some uh, things about goals in regards to ADL, sitting tolerance, and upcoming trips. So some things I'm gonna have to ask a few more questions about uh, during my subjective exam. Just the body chart that was presented to me, nothing too crazy. Um, it's a, just a very localized pain, which she described as a constant ache that did have intermittent intensity, which uh, she described as sharp increase in her pain. So obviously, before moving into your subjective exam, you kind of want to run some hypotheses through your mind to kind of figure out, you know, what actually is going on. So first thing that came to my mind, you know, is this an actual disc involvement? You know, she's associating her pain to a disc problem. However, you know, the body chart might not really suggest that, but it is something that's kind of going to be on my radar. Um, you know, given the fact she does have stage four breast cancer. Is this a potential metastasis? So, uh, PD Kettles was actually the first thing that came to my mind, uh, primary metastasis to bone, because she does have breast cancer. Um, is this a stenosis problem? You know, given her age, I mean, that's a possibility, although the body chart really doesn't suggest that just from looking at it, it is something that I might want to look out for. Uh, kind of getting more back into the uh, metastasis portion of things, you know, is there something internal going on that uh, might be revealed with imaging? So I'm just going to have to do some questioning regarding uh, when it's, uh, her latest imaging. Or is this just, you know, a simple mechanical pain that has aggravating and easing factors like a hypomobility or a stability problem? So these are the big things prior to even speaking with her, which I was uh, kind of going down that route. So bring her back, uh, start my subjective exam. So come to find out she's a retired professor and an avid traveler. And by avid traveler, I mean she goes to Europe like three or four times a year for like three or four weeks at a time. So she does a lot of traveling. She did talk to me about uh, the fact that she has actually had a previous history of these symptoms before. So about a year prior to seeing me, she developed this low back pain, which she kind of ignored and blew off to the side that eventually turned into ridiculous symptoms. So she had an MRI in January of 2016, which showed a slight disc herniation in L4, L5. Uh, she did have physical therapy after the MRI and did really well. She had been doing an exercise program and a walking program on her own for the past year until she got sick in the beginning of January, this past January was unable to do a lot of her exercises and uh, started to notice an increase in her back pain and wanted to come in direct access to do something about it because she does have an upcoming trip in the middle of March which she wanted to be able to go on. And I'll kind of touch base on the uh, PET scan in just a second and I just spoke about the, uh, the MRI. But getting into the actual red flags of things, you know, she wasn't reporting any neurological signs or symptoms such as numbness or tingling in the groin area. She was, uh, she didn't have any reports of increase or decrease in weight loss. She's sleeping well at night. Uh, she does have some fatigue that's secondary to some medications that she's taking, but she hasn't noticed any change with that. We did talk about her past medical history, so a little background on the actual breast cancer itself. She was diagnosed in 2011 with stage, or actually before stage four. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011. She had a lumpectomy in 2012. She ended up having to have a subsequent surgery after that. Um, they did a PET scan prior to that surgery and ended up finding a metastasis to her left glenoid. 
So instead of doing surgery, chemo, radiation, she wanted to do everything via medication. And for the last five years, she's been stage four breast cancer with just metastasis to her left lingual, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, we also kind of spoke about her osteonecrosis. So a side effect of one of the cancer medications she takes is osteonecrosis of the jaw. So in combination with all the doctor's appointments that she's going to for her cancer appointment, she's also going to see a specialist. Um, so she's driving, uh, traveling from the Blacksburg area to Charlottesville periodically for both her breast cancer appointments as well as osteoporosis. Did uh, also talk about uh, her lymphedema. So she does have mild bilateral upper extremity lymphedema and truncal lymphedema. And she doesn't think it's that big of a deal, but it is severe enough to where she does have lifting restrictions. So uh, I'll kind of get some more, more into that with the goals. But, um, and then also kind of talked about uh, osteopenia. Uh, she does have some osteopenia. She had a, I remember the last time she had a, a recent bone scan, but she did have uh, some low scores re uh, related to the lumbar region. And you know, that, that's a whole lot going on, a whole lot that can be playing a factor in regards to her pain and perception of her pain. And then she kind of talked to me about her husband. So her husband was just recently diagnosed with kidney cancer, and they had recently just found an, uh, an aortic aneurysm. So on top of everything they're doing for her, all of her treatment, all of her doctor's appointments, you know, they're trying to figure out what's the course of care for him, trying to figure out surgery, and trying to figure out if they're actually medically cleared to be able to go on to their trip. So a lot of stuff going on. So getting back more into the actual back pain itself, you know, sitting in the chair talking to me, two out of 10 pain, best it felt in the last 24 hours was one out of 10, with the worst being six to seven out of 10. She did elaborate on the fact that she did have some aggravating and easing factors. The aggravating factors being prolonged sitting, bending, sit to stand. She did state that uh, about 15 minutes is when she would start to notice an increase in her pain, but stated that the worst pain that she would experience is when she would perform a sit to stand after uh, prolonged sitting. But she did have some easing factor, uh, factors. So with uh, sitting, Changing positions temporarily provided some relief. However, walking immediately returned her pain to baseline, which is actually a really good sign. And then I, I spoke about our, uh, earlier regarding physical or past physical therapy interventions, which she had positive outcomes for. So kind of revisiting my hypotheses list from earlier, you know, is this an actual disc involvement? You know, it's kind of hard to say. I'm not really thinking that's the case here. Um, you know, she had the MRI in uh, January of 2016, which is about a year ago. And most research suggests that, you know, discs spontaneously recover in about six months in 75% of people. So it's been a year, so I can probably assume that that's maybe healed by now. You know, she had a recent PET scan for uh, the potential metastasis hypothesis, so that's kind of clear. And also uh, a lot of the back related to her neoplastic condition cluster signs, which she kind of also checked out on as well. And I'm not really thinking stenosis, you know, it's almost the opposite of stenosis. You know, she had having more problems with a lot of flexion-based activity and more uh, relief of extension type things. Preferred pain, kind of going back to metastasis, you know, no problems with uh, uh, the PET scan. They're probably thinking something more mechanical in nature given the fact she does have a lot of aggravating and easing factors. So my clinic was really big on the SINS model before doing your objective exam so that you can kind of figure out, you know, the vigor or how vigorous can I really be with my patient. So it's actually a little different, the SPIN, so they taught me the P for pain classification. Uh, so I'll kind of talk about that in a second. But severity, I gave her a moderate, you know, most of the time her pain is relatively low. However, it does have the capability of getting up to like a six or a seven. But she does have some restrictions in her ADL, so I really wouldn't qualify that more as a low here to, or a severity or a severe, so I gave her a moderate. Pain classification, you know, you can have three categories of pain, either being of nociceptive origin, uh, neurogenic, neuropathic, or a central component. Probably thinking more nociceptive in nature, given the fact that, you know, she has uh, aggravating and easing factors, very localized pain. Uh, with intermittent sharp periods. However, you know, given the, uh, the amount of psychosocial factors that are present in her life and the fact that she's also had a previous history of this problem before, I absolutely believe there's probably some central component to this as well. Uh, irritability, I was taught a T1, T2, T3 method, which I'm not going to really elaborate on, but I give her a low irritability given the fact that, you know, she's able to tolerate the 
drive from Blacksburg to Charlottesville for a doctor's appointment, so it's just about three hours. So it's a pretty good amount of time that she can actually tolerate her pain, and she actually sees a quick reduction in her pain when she performs walking. So I think it kind of gave her more of the uh, low irritability. Nature, uh, I don't mean nonspecific in like an alarming way, but more the fact that it's kind of hard to really associate where her pain is really coming from, but it is probably more mechanical in nature. Um, stage, you know, she's kind of getting out of that acute phase, you know, I'm seeing her like four weeks after her initial onset, and she's stable in regards to slopes, you know, she hasn't seen any changes in regards to her symptoms for better or for worse. So getting into my objective exam, you know, I'm just going to hit on the highlights that are most important to the actual case itself. So, you know, observation was sitting and standing, just standing and sitting with more of a posterior pelvic tilt. So in standing, she has that decreased lumbar lordosis. Quick active range of motion screen for flexion, 75%, which was painful, 50% pain, side bending right. Had her do repeated flexion 10 times that actually increased her pain. Had her do extension. First extension reduced her pain back to her baseline. Had her do another extension and actually eliminated her pain, which is a great sign. Joint mobility, T12 through L3, did spring testing. She had pain right before in range. However, when I got to L4, L5, she did have pretty severe pain right before I even got through the first tissue resistance, which kind of counters the fact that, you know, my SINS model was telling me low irritability, so she actually probably has a little bit more irritability than what I was actually predicting with my SINS model. Objective continued, so palpation, she was tender with bilateral PSIS and posterior SI ligaments. Oops. Uh, special tests, the only ones that were really important that actually reproduced her back pain. Uh, straight leg raise on the right, 32 or 35 degrees, which was painful, reproduced her pain in her back. Left was non-painful, and it was 55 degrees. Did clear the dip in the SI, so no problems with that. And then the chart below is just a quick overview of um, just manual muscle tests, which just uh, shows that she's overall pretty weak. So, what am I thinking? The first thing that came to my mind specific exercise in regards to biasing extension. You know, she doesn't have any distal or radicular symptoms. Um, however, she does have. A reduction in an eventual abolishment for pain when performing extension. So a lot of times when people want to associate a directional preference and centralization, they want to think that migration of symptoms from like a distal segment up towards the low back. However, Julia Fritz talks about in one of her articles that somebody actually might uh, be classified as a centralization when they have abolishment of pain or paresthesia when performing repeated motions or a position abolishes their pain. That's what I absolutely believe is she probably has a directional preference and a centralization component as well. I do have some comparable signs of things that actually reproduce her back pain, which would be right straight leg raise and side bending right. So these are some things that I can check periodically to make sure that what I'm actually doing is addressing her back pain. What am I thinking prognosis-wise? You know, she is coming in direct access, so I do have the 30-day limit. Uh, so about four weeks, I'm going to plan on seeing her two days per week, and I'm expecting a good outcome. I, I didn't give her an excellent or a poor, you know, poor or excellent. You know, she's got a lot going on, especially with her and her husband. So you know, anything can, can change at any time. So that's why I gave her a good instead of an excellent. So for the initial treatment. Uh, started out just doing some gentle grade one and grade two CPAs to L4, L5, more or less just for pain reduction. Checked my uh, asterisk signs after that. Right straight leg raise, 52 degrees and no pain. Awesome, but still had pain with side bending right. So then we just kind of moved towards more uh, neuromuscular activation type uh, exercise uh, with prone fluttering kicks, prone on elbows and posture holds while trying to reinforce an anterior pelvic tilt trying to bias extension as much, much as we could. So I checked side bending right again after that, 75% side bending right with no pain, which is awesome. So inform, So a lot of things that we did on the initial visit is what she was doing for her home exercise program initially. Then I talked to her about, you know, how you can do some um, pelvic rolls in the car, especially more towards or biasing the uh, anterior pelvic tilt whenever she does have to drive to Charlottesville for her appointments. So comes back in for visit two, 
Uh, recheck my asterisk signs again. Three out of ten pain. Uh, side bending right, right straight leg raise was painful at 40 degrees. There's a little carry over there, so you know, act, doing something that's making a difference. Continue my manual. Continue to uh, bias extension with the exercises that I had done previously. But also started to do some other things such as treadmill walking. We did some seated pelvic tilting, ball marching and ball perturbations while holding an anterior pelvic tilt. Checked everything again at the end. No pain with side bending right, 75%. And let's see. I don't know what that is. The golf. There we go. I think it's 50 degrees. But 50 degrees, uh, straight leg raise, uh, no pain. Awesome. So visit three, she's stating that she's feeling a lot better, and she started her walking program uh, that she'd been previously doing. Again, uh, side, or, so I checked the asterisk signs again at the beginning. Side bending right, one out of 10 pain, with straight leg raise being 45 degrees. Still painful, but you know, making improvements with each visit. Uh, she was able to tolerate a little bit uh, increase in my manual vigor th with this visit. Uh, and we also continued to uh, address some of the, just the strength impairments that she had, uh, whether it be with uh, bridging, just doing some standing hip abduction. We did some half bird dogs over a therapy ball to kind of uh, accommodate the fact that she had a lot of pain when she would put a lot of pressure through her arms, secondary to the lymphedema. And we did some other type of, uh, some other neuromuscular control activation type exercises as well. Checked everything at the end, side bending right, 75% no pain, and right straight leg raise, 52, no pain. Awesome. So visits four through five were very similar. Uh, she's continuing to walk, states that she's feeling a lot better. She actually doesn't have any pain at the beginning of her uh, treatment now with side bending right or the straight leg raise and just, uh, or it's a sensation of tightness. Uh, intervention, so, you know, kind of, uh, now that I've got her pain more or less under control, you know, I can start moving into more functional things, more functional patterning type things. So, still addressing some of the strength impairments, whether it be like hamstring curls, or we did some anterior pelvic tilt wall slides, but we also did some squat patterning. And the big thing, she uh, had a lot of problems early on with sit to stand, so we did some resistant sit to stand, which she was tolerating very well. Uh, so with visits four through five, she was consistently right straight leg raise, uh, 55 degrees and no pain. So visit six, so this was actually her last visit. So the last two weeks of her plan of care, so this was going to be about two weeks prior to when they were scheduled to leave for Europe. Um, they had a ton of doctor's appointments that they had to go to. So they were scheduling her husband's surgery. Um, they were trying to figure out if he was okay to actually fly on a plane. So they were going to Charlotte, they were coming to PT early in the week, going to Charlottesville and pretty much staying the whole week, come back next Monday and see me go back to Charlottesville for the last two weeks. So I didn't get to see her as long as I wanted to, but did a reassessment, 75% uh, forward flexion with side bending right as well, uh, no pain, and right straight leg raise was 55 degrees, which is symmetrical to the other side, no pain. Did see some slight improvements in strength um, really wasn't expecting to make a huge change in that, but given the fact I was only able to see her for six visits, but did see an increase uh, in uh, some of the strength uh, area, or some of the weakness uh, in her hips, especially. So kind of addressing some of the goals. Uh, so sitting was one of her goals. She's actually tolerating her drive to Charlottesville now with no pain whatsoever, which is awesome. So she's making it all the way for three hours with no pain. She feels very comfortable that she's going to be able to uh, tolerate the plane ride to Europe. So they were actually clear to be able to go to, to Europe, which is great for them. Uh, we did talk about her ADLs, so we did have to modify some stuff. Uh, so she had the lifting restrictions with the lymphedema. Um, so we talked about, you know, putting some stuff on higher levels to kind of reduce the fact that she has to, she can't really lift much. Uh, and then with the sit to stand, she's not having any pain with sit to stands after sitting for a long time especially with uh, getting out of the car after driving for three hours. So this is her um, initial and her photo discharge score. So photo kind of gives you a, um, a scale as to, you know, how, how much is this person really functioning? Uh, so her initial score was 50, and after six visits, she was scored 60, and they predict 
the actual photo predicted that she would be at 66 at 10 visits. And I feel like she would have meant that if I was able to see her for a little bit longer. But the fact that, you know, she was able to meet the threshold for both the MCID and the MDC makes me believe that this is actually probably one, you know, and a change that was important to her, as well as a real change that wasn't due to here as well. So limitations, you know, direct access can actually be a limitation sometimes, uh, since you're limited to 30 days, you know, it's usually not a big deal getting a doctor to sign off on an extended plan of care, but she did have the upcoming trip and they were getting ready to schedule her uh, husband's surgery, so afterwards they weren't going to be able to come in much because she was going to have to be doing a, whole, a lot of uh, caretaking um, with her husband. Uh, upper lifting restrictions with the lymphedema was a limitation. There were some other exercises that I wanted to do, but I just couldn't because she couldn't tolerate uh, a lot of weight in her hands. And I don't consider the central component of her pain a limitation, but more or less I would like to see how well she was responding to everything after her husband's surgery. So they scheduled her husband's surgery for the first week of April. So I would have been curious to see, you know, how, how was she feeling after that surgery, especially if it went really well. So what would I have done differently? You know, given the fact that I wasn't able to see her for as long as, as I wanted to, you know, spending some time on the actual education of uh, chronic pain, since most of those factors are psychosocial in nature. So to kind of counter the fact that I wasn't able to see her, you know, spending some time on, you know, the importance of psychosocial factors and the impact that it can have on disability may have, uh, you know, I could have maybe seen an increase in my photo score if I kind of incorporated that more into my plan of care as well. My references, any questions? Yes. Was visit six like the end of the 30 day direct access? Or the, could you have seen it longer? Or? No, that was it. Did you see any improvements in uh, great labor aid in the left? I never checked left again because it would never reproduce her pain. It wasn't painful initially. All I know is that it was the right straight leg raise was eventually symmetrical to what the initial was on the left. Yes. And you said that she had like some hypermobility spring testing uh, a little bit lower for us. Did you check any higher? Because um, it seems like that there was a solid chance that she had more than a mobility somewhere. Um, and what would you think about for appropriateness for other So, you know, given the fact that she was pretty hypo, well, I believe there might have been some type of hypomobility aspect to it, but given the fact that she was fairly irritable during her initial, um, the, during the initial eval, wasn't really able to formally assess it. And plus the fact that I was, what I was doing with her was actually making a difference was fine. But I mean, I also applied like the, the stabilization, the manipulation CPR, but you know, given the fact that she was an active mechanicer, cancer metastasis so like when you apply those relative and the absolute contraindications to manipulation cancer is one of them and given the fact that she does have osteopenia related to her lumbar spine i would have felt very happy with manipulation but more or less she probably wouldn't be able to tolerate the position as well yes you speak to the ones with email the lifting restrictions yes what about it why does she have lifting restrictions so she said that the doctor that she was seeing said that, you know, she wasn't able to lift if it's more than eight pounds. Like, <coughs> she had any interventions? She, like, so she had asked me, she was like, does PT do anything for lymphedema stuff? And I'm like, yeah. But she was like, you know, there's nearly not enough of it. She was having a hard time finding somebody for it. And I didn't know about them, anybody in the area. You hear, not there. Yeah. I just want to reiterate that generally, um, people with lymphedema shouldn't have lymphedema restriction. In fact, they're showing now that exercise actually prevents people. So there's a, you know, the, the waves of change are slow. Yeah. You know, so there's still a lot of clinicians out there saying after surgery, you can even surgery, you can breast cancer surgery. So don't use your arm, you know, don't lift over your head for the rest of your life. And it's weird because I could give her like a two pound dumbbell or something and she would be able to tolerate that. Well, well she's not been lifting for how long? Yeah, that's exactly it's, right. It's not just fear this one. It's yeah. Like, you know, and that, I think that could even contribute to some back pain. Yeah, absolutely. Can't. 
counts as a gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. I have a question about neural mobilization. So I'm just curious, talking about those at all. So I'm surprised by your straightly raised finger ask your sign, but would you use neural mobilization with your Oh, uh, you know, I really didn't think about that as much because the fact that I was able to reproduce her pain just by, you know, she wasn't having any distal symptoms initially, so if that were occurring, I might have gone more the neurodynamic route or more or less to check it out, but the fact that it was a very localized pain and I was able to reproduce it with straight leg raids, I was using more of the pain provocation. Deal problem. 